Uh, thank you for coming out to Dallas Hall. I'm back to the hilltop for the Center for Presidential History and another year of our presidential memoir and biography programming. Uh, we are very thrilled to be able to present, I think, a really impressive I think, a docket of events this year. This year, in addition to, of course, the topic tonight, we're gonna to be discussing uh, things such as the relationship between uh, oil and religion. We're gonna be discussing the sort of the, the hidden history of how the Transcontinental Railroad was uh, largely constructed by Chinese workers who have, for the most part, their identities haven't been lost to history. We're also gonna be discussing the last days of FDR. And in particular, I want to highlight a couple of different events to you. Uh, the first is on the 22nd of October. Uh, we are going to be having a full day symposium. Actually, to be honest, it starts at lunch. Uh, lunch and then the rest. Uh, where we're going to be discussing this book, which is not yet published, so it doesn't actually exist in my hand. Uh, the last card, this is a project that the Center for Presidential History with partners at Harvard and Duke and University of Texas have been working on for the last five and a half years. It's an oral history of President Bush's decision in 2006 to surge troops in Iraq. And when I say it's an oral history, what that really means is we got everybody on the record. Uh, from President Bush on down telling us exactly how that complex bureaucratic fight and process played out over the course of many months. And in addition to the fact that you can you know, get the book and read what we consider to be a narrative history drawn from the oral histories, you can also subsequently go online and watch the full two hour interviews yourself with all those people. I highly encourage this. This is very fun. Uh, and consequently, we think that this is going to be a, a resource for uh, students and for historians for generations to come. Uh, and of course, especially on the anniversary that we celebrate or remark, I should say, commemorate today, uh, it's important to remember the impact of all those decisions. And uh, one of our roles, of course, not only being to educate future students, but also to try to give resources to students who, wait for it, uh, were coming into our classes who were not yet born on 9-11, so something that we are very uh, pleased in, uh, to do, and I encourage you to come on the 22nd for that. Um, second thing which I'd like to highlight is, of course, our annual D-Day trip. Uh, last year, about two dozen SMU students and friends of the university went to London, then to Normandy, then to Paris, to do a, a real in-the-flesh view of everything that happened in Operation Overlord and the uh, liberation of Northwest Europe and the liberation of France and Paris ultimately. So consequently, we are doing this again this May. There's a flyer you can grab if you're interested in joining us. This is really a wonderful opportunity to have a intergenerational conversation between our students and those who are friends of the university to get a chance to feel history up close and talk about it with those who are experiencing it from perhaps a different perspective. And I have to tell you, the historian to traveler ratio on this trip is extraordinarily high. I think it's about three to one. So uh, I highly encourage you to take a look at that, grab a flyer. And then there's one more thing I want to announce, which is a new initiative that we have this year, which we're calling our Article II Society. Uh, free book to anyone who can tell me what the Article II refers to. I, yes, I, I know you knew it. Uh, that, of course, is the section of the Constitution that refers to the presidency, which should tell you, of course, that what really mattered was Congress way long ago. Insert your own joke here. Uh, and consequently, this is a new society that we're, fun, that we're forming to enable people to have a little bit more access and a little bit more private conversation with some of the speakers and fellows and visiting scholars that we have coming to the university. And the resources that we are going to glean from this will be used almost invariably for student scholarships. So if you think about the importance of showing, as I think is critical, one of our 20-year-olds or 21-year-olds, showing them that D-Day beach in person, how it can transform those lives by seeing the sacrifices that other people made and the importance of thinking about historical events, well, frankly, that's something that I think can change any student's life and we try to support. I have to tell you, on this last trip, we had 15 students and I think 13 emotional breakdowns. Uh, and I mean that in the best of ways, which is to say, right around day five or six, when our students realized that the thousands of people that we're describing sacrificing themselves are younger than they, or that people in their class who have trouble perhaps making their eight o'clock class, or sometimes their 11 o'clock class, 
uh, were in charge of 150 people's lives, that can cause a little bit of a, a break. And it was really a wonderful experience to then be able to take the students out and talk them, talk them down, talk them through this experience. And it really does, I think, it, we say this often, but it really does change lives. So we encourage you to pick up some information about that. You'll be receiving some email information about that and also some old-fashioned snail mail information about that. To wit, if you received an email from us earlier this month asking for your mailing address, uh, please, if you would, fill that out. We, of course, already have your email address, but we want to be able to send you a little bit more information the old-fashioned way. Keep the Postal Service employed. Now, finally, uh, I would like to turn to the reason you're here tonight, not just to hear advertisements, but for the actual topic of the evening. Uh, it is a great pleasure of mine to introduce Susan Page, who has uh, not only been a, a brilliant writer for so many years, but also has become a friend. And I have to say, uh, when I heard that she was going to be working on a biography of Barbara Bush, that struck me as a little bit of perhaps a kamikaze mission. Um, because, you know, now it's always difficult to write on somebody who is still around to critique your writing. It's especially difficult when that person is full of critiques. <laughs> so I'm glad that she took on this mission, which I would not have. Uh, and Susan was well qualified to do it, of course, a, a native of Kansas. She studied at Northwestern and then at Columbia University, became uh, the White House, new, White House correspondent for Newsday, and then ultimately moved over to USA Today for that same position and eventually rose to be White House, uh, excuse me, Washington bureau chief and has that position, which I'm sure is very calm and, <laughs> and nothing goes on. Um, and in fact, I did want to take one more second to say that to remind you before I introduce you that everything lives forever on the internet. Uh, so I did find the following quotes that you have made of the nine presidents that you have interviewed over the course of your life. Ronald Reagan, you said, was the one who perhaps had the most powerful impact on the country. George H.W. Bush was the most popular president with the White House Press Corps. And Bill Clinton, uh, covering him was like riding a roller coaster. Whenever it seemed about to come to a stop, it would slowly begin to climbing some hill and then send you screaming over the top again. <laughs> so if Clinton was a roller coaster, <laughs> so. without further ado, if you'll join me in welcoming Susan to the... <laughs> there are no words. I want to first of all thank uh, thank all of you for for coming tonight. So that my anxiety dream last night that I would be addressing an empty hall did not come true, and to SMU and the Center for Presidential History, which is such an outstanding organization and, and one on which I have relied as a reporter for years. And a special thanks to Jeffrey Engel. Let's give him a round of applause. For one thing, his, his books about George H.W. Bush were a real resource for me in doing this book, including When the World Seemed New and The China Diary. Uh, and for another, in the interview I did with Jeff for this book, for The Matriarch, he shared both advice on doing presidential research and thoughtful insights into the relationship between Barbara Bush and George Bush. And I am uh, grateful to you for that, Jeff. Thank you. So I had never uh, written a book before. And uh, I did something that was either brilliant or stupid. And I'll let you decide. Maybe we'll have a show of hands. Uh, I got an agent. I wrote a bit book proposal. I met with publishers. I signed a contract. And only at that point did I contact Barbara Bush or any of the Bushes to tell them I was doing this. <laughs> I'm not going to take that show of hands, because I can tell where you think. Here, here was my reasoning. My reasoning was, if I went to Barbara Bush, who I'd interviewed over the years, and said, I'm going to do this biography, will you cooperate? Will you let me interview you? And she said no, that that would have made it been very discouraging, and maybe I would have backed out. But if I went to her before I was committed to doing it, and she said yes, I was worried that she would think she would have some sway over what I wrote. And I didn't want to write an authorized biography. I wanted to write a work of journalism. I wanted to write about the things I would discover that were great and the things that I, the, the warts I might uh, discover. I wanted to write about wherever my reporting took me. So that's why I did that. And then after signing the contract, 
One evening, I sent three carefully crafted emails simultaneously, one to Barbara Bush saying, I've signed a contract to write a biography of you, and I hope that you'll let me come interview you. And I sent one to George W. Bush, who I'd interviewed uh, as well uh, many times, and told him I was writing a biography of his mother, and I hoped he would cooperate. And I sent one to Jeb Bush, who I'd also interviewed over the years uh, with the same message. And 30 seconds later, an email came back from Jeb Bush that was three words long. It said, does mother know? <laughs> So after about a week, Barbara Bush sent me a note back and said that she would indeed agree to one interview. And so I went to Houston um, and uh, had an interview with her. And at that point, of course, I wasn't sure if I would have a second interview or if this was my one shot at her. And as a result, even though she was 92 years old and suffering from congestive heart failure, it was as though I had arrested her and was interrogating her because I knew any question I had to ask, I better ask this time. So this was a uh, extremely aggressive interview, um, and it was a ton of fun and at the, for me. Uh, and at the end of it, I said, thank you for this interview. May I have a second interview? And she said yes. And so I came down and had a second interview. And after the end of the second interview, I said, may I have a third interview? You can see where this is going. She said yes. And in the end, I had five extended interviews with her during the last six months of her life. And in, and in fact, we had scheduled a sixth interview, and I had gone to Texas for that interview, and the night before we were scheduled to meet, she fell, she broke her back, she went into the hospital, and she never recovered. So that fifth interview was the last time, the last time I saw her. At the very first interview that I did, she said, don't even ask me about my diaries, you can't see them. <laughs> Which, if you know Barbara Bush, sounds very much like Barbara Bush. And I could understand that because if I had diaries, which I don't, I would never let a reporter see them. <laughs> but at the third interview, I said, you know, I'm, I'm, I was really interested in her relationship with Reza Gorbachev, which I argue in the book played a role in the peaceful end to the Cold War in a way that's not been previously acknowledged. And I said, you know, I'm so interested in this. And we had talked about Reza Gorbachev in interviews, I said, could I read the entries in your diary that relate to Ray Isaac Gorbachev? And she said, I'll think about it, which I thought meant no. And at the end of the fifth interview, um, I stood up and I said, thank you for the fifth interview. May I have a sixth? And she said, yes. And I said, you know, I, t I ask you to think about whether I could see your diary entries on Ray Isaac Gorbachev. Have you had a chance to think about that? And she said, yes, I've thought about it. You can see them. You can see them all. You can see all my diary entries. And those were almost the last words she ever said to me. And I was so surprised that I said the worst possible thing in response. I said, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> you know, if someone gives something you really, really want, do not say, oh, do you want to take it back? But she said, yes, I'm sure. And of course, Barbara Bush was almost always pretty sure. And as a result, I had this extraordinary opportunity to read her diaries. She started keeping diaries in one form or another, and intermittently, starting in 1948, when she was a young mother in Midland, Texas. And she kept those diaries the rest of her life, not every day, Sometimes months would go by, but in one form or another, she would keep these diaries for the rest of her life. Her last diary entry was made 12 days before she died. And in that last diary entry, it was after, it was the day that her doctor came into the hospital room and said, you're going to go home, but you're going to go home to hospice care. And Barbara Bush said, does that mean I'm going to die? And the doctor said, yes. That's her last diary entry. So this was just an extraordinary opportunity uh, for which I am uh, deeply grateful to Barbara Bush uh, for giving me. I don't know, this is a Texas crowd. How many of you had met Barbara Bush in one way or another? So, and the bells are ringing. Uh, maybe that's Barbara Bush speaking to us. 
so try that again. How many people have ever met her in any way? So you'd like, so whether, let me ask the second question. Whether or not you ever met her, how many of you felt like you knew her? <laughs> yeah, like everybody. Well, you know, that's something I found in these presidential campaigns I covered. The, um, I'm heading into my 11th presidential campaign uh, at this point. My, it's, my, it's my only job skill, so I'm glad we continue to have elections. But in seven of the past 10 campaigns, of the past 10 campaigns that I've been uh, covering as a journalist, Barbara Bush has played a role, which is remarkable. And one thing that struck me was that voters of all stripes, liberals and conservatives and Republicans and Democrats, tended to like Barbara Bush, tended to feel like they knew her, thought she was approachable and warm and a wonderful grandmother, and they loved the white hair and the, and the strands of fake pearls. Uh, and the reason I wanted to write a book about her is because she was that, but that was a very incomplete picture of who Barbara Bush was. Because she was, she was warm um, and uh, loving and uh, blunt, she was all that. She was also smart and caustic, and she could be a little mean. She was mean to me on occasion. Uh, she was consequential in a way that I thought had not been recognized. I think like a lot of women of her, of her generation, her contributions were not acknowledged or recognized by her, by her mother, by her teachers, uh, by her husband, and by herself. And so that was the story that I wanted to tell. You know, the, uh, the, when I finished the first draft of the book, I had as the first chapter uh, a chapter on the 1988 election, the election that put George H.W. Bush in the White House and fulfilled this really almost a lifetime of ambition uh, for the White House. And when I finished the draft, I realized that this was wrong. That the 1980, if you were writing a biography of George Bush, the 1988 campaign would be an appropriate first chapter because that was very much a defining event in President Bush's life. But that was not the defining event in Barbara Bush's life. And I came to believe that the defining event in Barbara Bush's life was the death of her daughter, Robin, when Barbara Bush was 29 years old and Robin was three. She was diagnosed with leukemia a disease that neither George nor Barbara Bush had ever heard of. She underwent six months of really brutal treatment at Sloan Kettering. At that point, no one had ever been diagnosed with leukemia and survived. It was a death sentence. But there was research going on into treating leukemia, and Robin underwent some of those treatments, really an early form of chemotherapy, in at Sloan Kettering, and her mother was by her side. And I think the reason that this was, of course, the death of a child, a tragedy in every way, but I think it made, I think it affected Barbara Bush in two big ways. I think it made her tougher, harder. Uh, it made her less concerned about what other people thought about her, less concerned about criticism that people might level at her, uh, because she had survived the worst thing that could have happened to her. But it also made her more, it made her softer on the inside. It made her more empathetic. Uh, you know, she had lived a pretty privileged life up to then, uh, but she discovered that all the money and power and position and social standing in the world could not do one thing to save Robin's life. And in the parents' waiting room in the leukemia ward at Sloan Kettering, she got to know other parents from much less privileged circumstance who were all in the same boat as she was. And I think that created a thread through her life. It was a thread I saw through her diaries. Uh, in her diaries, she would note, this is the day Robin was born. This is the day Robin died. Uh, I wonder what Robin will look like in heaven. Will she still be three years old? Uh, Robin was on her mind through the rest of her life. 
And it was a thread through her public life as well in a way she almost never discussed. I'll give you an, I'll give you an example. In the first 100 days of Barbara Bush being First Lady, she went to visit Grandma's house, which was a pretty new hospice then in DC. It's still in operation. The same two women who founded it still run it. And it was a hospice for babies with AIDS who had been abandoned by their families. And she went and visited Robin's house, uh, Grandma's house. She didn't make a big speech. Um, she didn't issue a policy paper. Um, all she did was go to Grandma's house and bring news reporters and news photographers with her. And when she was in Grandma's house, they were giving her a tour, and there was a baby named Donovan, a six months old, a fussing in his crib, and she picked him up and hugged him. And the photographers took a picture of it, and this picture had an incredible impact on changing or beginning to change attitudes toward people with HIV AIDS. Because at that point, there were a lot of people who were just thought you couldn't touch a baby who had AIDS because maybe you would get AIDS yourself. And this was a picture of her acting as though it was the most natural thing in the world to pick up Donovan, even though he had AIDS, and to hug him. And she put her cheek next to his cheek. I wonder, does anyone here remember that photo? Because AIDS activists tell me that it was a seismic event for people who were struggling with the stigma than surrounding people with HIV AIDS. And she did something else that I think is so interesting and shows how wise she was. She had met privately at Grandma's house with a group, a small group, a half dozen adults who had AIDS. And in this meeting, a man named Lou Toscani said to her, you know, everybody thinks the babies are blameless, but we need a hug too. And so Barbara Bush said, I'll give you a hug, Lou, and she gave him a hug. And when they came out into the public space where the reporters and photographers were, she made a point of giving Lou Toscani a hug again so that there would be pictures of her hugging an adult who had AIDS. And the message there was, you could have a coworker who has AIDS and you don't need to worry about getting AIDS. It was just, again, a powerful statement. And about two years later, Lou Toscani was in the hospital uh, in the final days of his life and having a, a very rough time. And a friend of his cold called the White House, called the switchboard, 4561414. You know, it's just like he had no special number. He called 4561414. He asked to talk to the First Lady's office. Uh, it rang through. Anna Perez, who was then Mrs. Bush's press secretary, picked up the phone. And this man who I interviewed for the book said, uh, I, I don't know how to explain this. I have a friend who met with Mrs. Bush, um, and she gave him a hug at Grandma's house. And Anna said, oh, Lou Toscani. And the reason that strikes me as powerful is that it meant that Lou Toscani was not a prop for Barbara Bush at that event. He was a human being. And the, the friend said, Lou's in the final days of his life. He's having a very hard time. I think it would mean a lot. That event meant a lot to him. I think it would mean a lot if he got a letter from Barbara Bush. So Barbara Bush, of course, immediately wrote him a letter, and wrote written a letter on White House stationery saying, uh, Lou, uh, I treasure the time I met you. Uh, your life has had meaning. You've made a difference. And the friend told me that it made all the difference to Lou Toscani in making his passing easier to have had that letter from Barbara Bush. You know, the Barbara Bush's interest in uh, the, I'll, I'll tell you, let me, one more thing. I, I'll tell you why I think this issue of HIV AIDS and the stigma surrounding people who had HIV AIDS meant so much to her was because she saw it through Robin's eyes. And she told me that, you know, Barbara Bush was not much of a crier. Like, you can get George Bush to cry at the drop of a hat, right? <laughs> you could have, watch a sad TV ad with him and he'd be crying. Barbara Bush was much harder to get to cry. Um, but tear, in one of the interviews I did with her, tears came welled up in her eyes when she told me about bringing Robin home from Sloan Kettering for one final visit 
before she would go back to the hospital to die. And they wanted to bring her back to Midland so that she could see her big brother George and the baby Jeb, and so that their friends and neighbors could come and say goodbye to Robin. And Barbara Bush told me that some of her closest friends refused to visit because they were afraid they would catch leukemia. And how painful that was for her. And so when I think, I think when Barbara Bush saw what was happening, the same thing was happening for people with HIV AIDS. That's why it had such an impact on her. And this concern about the issue of HIV AIDS, uh, which she worked behind the scenes at the White House to get her husband's White House to pay more attention to the issue of AIDS, it resonated through her son's White House. You know, one of the best things that George W. Bush did was the PEPFAR initiative uh, that addressed AIDS in Africa. And when I interviewed George W. Bush for this book, he said that that reflected in part his mother's interest in the issue of AIDS. And you look at Barbara Pierce Bush, her granddaughter and namesake, who co-founded the Global Health Corps, which also deals with AIDS issues around the world. And it makes you realize that Robin's death and Barbara Bush's reaction to it ended up saving millions of lives around the world. There are other ways in which I think Barbara Bush had a big impact. And I had mentioned Reza Gorbachev. Now, Reza Gorbachev was impossible. She was rude and didactic. She would go to these international events and lecture everybody else about how communism was so superior to capitalism. Um, and she, as a result, got into a big feud with Nancy Reagan. I don't know if you remember that, but it was very clear that these two women did not like each other. And Barbara Bush, when she was second lady, looked at that and told me she thought it was, the exact word she used was stupid. And she thought it was stupid, not because she didn't understand it, because she also found Reza Gorbachev a difficult personality, but because she thought it wasn't helpful that President Reagan and then President Bush were trying to negotiate the end of the Cold War. It was not helpful to have the wives at war with one another. So I found a letter that she sent to her brother Scott the day before she was going to meet with Reza Gorbachev for the first time as First Lady. And in this letter, she said, I'm going to see Reza Gorbachev tomorrow. I'm going to love her no matter what she, I'm going to love her no matter what she does. And she did. She cultivated a friendship with Reza Gorbachev that became important to the end of the Cold War. And that was an, I knew that she had made a big effort with Reza Gorbachev to have a friendlier relationship than uh, a warmer relationship than Reza Gorbachev had had with Nancy Reagan. Uh, and I was, I wanted to figure out if it actually made a difference. Because obviously, it wasn't the reason the Cold War ended. But did it make a difference that Barbara Bush did this? And I'll tell you three people who said it made a difference. One was Helmut Kohl, uh, in a, who was then the Chancellor of West Germany, who in declassified, a declassified phone call he had with Mikhail Gorbachev talked about how Mrs. Bush was such a calming presence in the White House, and that has not always been the case, which <laughs> who could he possibly have been referring to? <laughs> Helmut Kohl then reported to President Bush that Mikhail Gorbachev had responded by saying, by agreeing that it was very helpful uh, that uh, Barbara Bush uh, was such a calming influence that Mrs. Gorbachev agreed with him and that they did not talk of other women, <laughs> which I think is also a reference to Nancy Reagan. Uh, and then I interviewed um, twice uh, the, um, the, the man who was then the Prime Minister of, uh, of Canada, um, uh, Mulroney, Brian Mulroney, um, who was very close to President Bush and was president and was the prime minister of Canada at the time of all these negotiations. And he said that uh, Mikhail Gorbachev trusted no one as much as he trusted Reza Gorbachev. And that the, 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 the energy and affection that Barbara Bush managed to uh, generate there made a difference in those negotiations. Um, and that she, he, he could not, he, and he, he also said that when George Bush was making the most important decisions of his presidency, including his decision to go to war in the first Gulf War, 
the voice he wanted, the person he wanted by his side, the voice he wanted to hear was Barbara Bush. You know, uh, since we're here at SMU, so near to the George W. Bush Library, uh, it is, of course, George W. Bush's election that made Barbara Bush an historic figure as both the mother of one president and the wife of another, and the only other woman to have ever done that is. Abigail Adams, of course, a university crowd. You all know the answer to that. Someone once said that to Barbara Bush, and she said, well, actually, Abigail Adams died before her son became white president, so. <laughs> When, uh, when George W. Bush was elected, his father said that he wasn't going to meddle, that he wasn't going to offer advice unless advice was asked for. Uh, and George W. Bush uh, pretty rarely asked his father for advice. Um, Barbara Bush made no promise like that. Uh, she felt free to weigh in uh, when she thought he was doing something good. And at, uh, I, I can tell you she talked with great emotion about the job he did uh, on this day 18 years ago, uh, and with great pride about his leadership of the country through that difficult time. But she also came to feel that the Iraq war was on the wrong course, and that he was listening to the wrong people. He was listening to Dick Cheney and Don Rumsfeld, and not listening to people like Jim Baker and Brent Scowcroft. And this was an opinion she felt free to share with him. One White House staffer told me you could hear them talking in the Oval Office from the <laughs> I think it's pretty soundproof there, so I think talking is probably something you put in quotes. Um, and President George W. Bush told me that uh, he finally told his mother that Cheney wasn't president and Rumsfeld wasn't president. He was president. He was making the decisions. She should trust in his judgment. And then she backed off, kind of. I think not <laughs> absolutely 100%. You know, the, I know you've all seen the, the wonderful statues in the courtyard at the George W. Bush Library. And it really, it's got George W. Bush and George H. W. Bush. And they really look like the same man at different stages of life. They look so much alike. But George W. Bush was really more like his mother in his personality. That kind of humor, uh, the impatience, uh, the kind of caustic nation, uh, caustic uh, uh, caustic commentary that both of them could make sometimes to their detriment. Uh, Marlon Fitzwater, who was George, the elder George Bush's press secretary, told me a great story about, that Barbara Bush didn't, Barbara Bush, who had been a smoker and stopped smoking with some difficulty, uh, would give Marlon a hard time about smoking cigars because Marlon loved to smoke cigars. And uh, so, by the way, did George W. Bush. And so at the 1992 convention, Republican convention in Houston, Marlin went to find a secret place in the convention hall to smoke a cigar because he didn't want to see Barbara Bush. So he goes like down one hall and around another hall and through a corner. And he, he's at the end of a hallway and he figures it's safe. So he lights up a cigar. And who comes down the hall but George W. Bush. And George W. Bush says, oh, Marlon, great, you've got a cigar. Do you have another cigar? And he said, yes, I do. And he gives George W. Bush a cigar. And they're both at the uh, coward at the end of this hallway, <laughs> avoiding Barbara Bush, smoking cigars. And then who comes down the hallway but, yes, Barbara Bush. <laughs> and when they see her in the distance, they both do the same thing. They put their cigars in their pocket. <laughs> in the hopes that she has not noticed what they were doing. So Barbara Bush comes up and has a little chit chat, this and that, how you doing, blah, blah, blah. And then she turns around to leave. And she's walking down the hall and they are, Marlon says, relieved. And she turns back and she says, by the way, boys, your pants are on fire. <laughs> so she had a wonderful sense of humor and uh, uh, and she was a, a dynamic person. Um, but, you know, Barbara Bush also had some insecurities and vulnerabilities that she rarely let people see. She was insecure about her looks. That is, in part, a legacy from her mother. Her mother gave her a hard time about weighing too much from the day she was a little girl. Uh, I asked her in an interview to characterize her siblings. What would the nicknames for her siblings be? And she said, well, Martha was the pretty one. Martha was her older sister, who was, in fact, 
very pretty, sometimes worked as a model, was on the cover of Vogue when she was in college. Yeah. So. Martha was a pretty one. She said, Jimmy, her older brother, Jimmy was a Pex bad boy. He was, Jimmy was constantly in trouble, but was so endearing that no one seemed to mind. She said, Scott, her younger brother, was the perfect one. Uh, Scott was a very endearing character indeed. I was pleased to interview him for the book a couple times. And I said, okay, well, what were you? And she said, I was the little fat one. And I think that is how she, I think that is how she saw herself. Uh, she, there was even a point, there was even a point uh, during her life when she struggled with depression. Uh, when the Bushes came back from China and uh, George Bush took over head of the CIA, she found herself, uh, she found him in a job he, she, he couldn't share with her, uh, although they had shared, uh, you know, they'd been partners in his previous jobs. She had an empty nest at home. Her kids had either gone off on their own lives or were away at school. She was going through menopause. She thinks that may have been a factor. But she fell into a, a more than a sadness, a real depression. And she told me that she contemplated suicide during this time of her life, that she would be driving down the road and thinking how easy it would be to plow into a tree. Or could she steer her car into the path of an oncoming car? And that she would have to pull over to the side of the road and stop and wait for this impulse to pass. Uh, it's so at odds with our image of Barbara Bush to think about her during that time. In fact, when I talked to her brother Scott about it, he, he said he didn't believe it, that it wasn't that serious. Uh, Bar I asked Barbara Bush how she came out of that because she told almost no one. She told only her husband. Uh, and she said that she didn't know why she came out of it, that eventually after about six months it seemed to pass. And that one thing that she did was she went to volunteer at a place in Washington that was then called the Washington Home for the Incurables, which is an unfortunate name and has now been changed to the Washington Home and Ho uh, Hospital and Ho Hospice Center. Um, and it's a place for people who have terminal illnesses. Um, and she said that volunteering there made her feel better. And I wonder if there's a, a message there that if you, if you enter a rough patch, find somebody in a rougher one, try to help them, Maybe it'll help you. She seemed to think it helped her. Barbara Bush kept score. She nursed grudges. Let me tell you about just one of them. That would be Nancy Reagan. <laughs> I, uh, I covered the Reagan White House. It was the first White House I covered. I was working for Newsday then. And we all in the press corps knew that Nancy Reagan and Barbara Bush were not best friends. We did not realize that they were mortal enemies. <laughs> but in fact, there was friction between them from the very beginning, from the point Bush got on the ticket with Reagan in 1980 until the end of their lives. Uh, and Nancy Reagan, for, for whatever reasons, and I'm sure Nancy Reagan has her a side of the story here, uh, but from Barbara Bush's point of view, she found Nancy Reagan quite impossible and pretty mean. And just one example, the, you know, the, the best social event, the hottest social ticket in the eight years of the Reagan administration was the White House dinner for Prince Charles and Princess Di. Does anybody remember that? The picture of Princess Di dancing with John Travolta. So the first, in the, out of the Reagan archives, we found the first White House guest list that went from the social secretary to Mrs. Reagan with the people to invite to this dinner. And the first line on this memo is President and Mrs. Reagan, and the second line is Vice President and Mrs. Bush, and then they have other officials. And Nancy Reagan picked up her pen and crossed out the Bush's names. And yeah, I know. See, that alone is worth $32.50 just as... <laughs> Just that story itself. Anyway. So Michael Deaver, who was then the deputy White House chief of staff for Reagan, and who was kind of in charge of Nancy, called her on the phone and said, Nancy, you can't not invite the vice president and Mrs. Bush to this dinner. And Nancy Reagan replied, just watch me. 
and they were not invited. I don't know. They, they had a final blow up uh, a couple days after the Bushes had moved out of the White House. Nancy Reagan had given a very negative interview to ABC about the Bushes on Inauguration Day. Isn't that peculiar? Uh, and then she called the next day to the Bushes, who had gone back to Houston, of course feeling pretty crushed about having lost the election, and to try to explain away what it was she had said uh, to ABC. And Barbara Bush refused to take the call. So the next day, Nancy Reagan called back again. And Barbara Bush said, no, I'm not going to take the call. And it was through the White House switchboard. And the White House switchboard operator said, Mrs. Bush, aren't you going to take Mrs. Reagan's call? And she said, OK, I'll take Mrs. Reagan's call. So Nancy Reagan gets on the line and starts to explain how this and that, and she didn't really mean this, and it was, uh, you can't trust reporters. And, and uh, Barbara Bush said, I've had enough explaining from you. Don't ever call me again. And then she said, oh, my other line is ringing, and hung up. <laughs> now, they didn't, in fact, have another line. There was no other line ringing. <laughs> And the two women never had another extended conversation for the rest of their lives. Whew. Yeah. Yeah. OK, one, one last grudge. And that would be, this is going to surprise you that Barbara Bush did not think much of Donald Trump. <laughs> Actually, in her diaries, I found an entry about Donald Trump from 1990 saying, that he was a symbol of all the greed, of all that was wrong with the 1980s. So she started out with not a very good opinion of him. And then he beat up on her son, Jeb, in 2016. She didn't much like that, that either. Uh, she uh, made no secret to all her friends knew that she didn't like Donald Trump. She, in fact, didn't vote for Donald Trump. She wrote in Jeb's name, voting for president in 2016. And in, tw in the summer of 2017, the last uh, summer of her life, she, they were in Kennebunkport, as always. And a friend of hers, as a joke, gave her a gag gift, a Trump countdown clock. Do you know what those are? Some of you seem to have them. You're just nodding here. <laughs> you know, it's a little clock that says how many days and hours and minutes and seconds are left in President Trump's first term. Uh, in fairness, they had these for Obama. They had these for Bush. These are not new. But apparently a big seller recently. And so the friend gave her this countdown clock, which she loved. And she put it on uh, this table in Kenny Bunkport next to the chair where she would often sit when she was going to needlepoint. It was in her, in her bedroom. It was in a place where she would see it a lot. And when they went back to Houston at the end of the season, she liked it so much that she took it with her. And she put it on her bedside table in Houston, where it would be the first thing she would see in the morning <laughs> and the last thing she would see at night. And it was there until the day she died. The first time I interviewed her, it was coming up on the first year of, since Tr President Trump's election. And I asked her if she still thought she was a Republican. And she said yes. And then in February, uh, five months later, I said, you know, in October, you told me you thought you were still a Republican. Do you still think you're a Republican? And she said, no, I don't think I'm a Republican anymore, which is pretty extraordinary. The wife of a Republican president, the mother of a Republican president, a woman who had been a face of the Republican Party for decades, she said she no longer thought she was a Republican. I said she was, in, in, in closing, there, I said that I thought she was consequential. And I thought I would just mention four ways in which I, thought, I think she was consequential in ways that have not always been acknowledged or recognized. First of all, she enabled George H.W. Bush to solve the conundrum that continues to bedevil many of us, and that is how to have both a career and a family. Because her uh, role at home, at having a stable and warm home life with all those kids, enabled George Bush to pursue his very active careers that often took him away for a long period of time. She made it possible for him to become the man and the leader he became. He, uh, he, he came to rely on her. He didn't rely on her advice uh, at the start. They had a very traditional marriage. In fact, soon after they had gotten married and he was graduating from Yale, he was trying to figure out what to do. And he came home one day 
and said to Barbara Bush, uh, I've decided we're going to move to Odessa, Texas <laughs> to, be in the, to get a start in the oil business. And Barbara Bush said, I've always wanted to live in Odessa, Texas. <laughs> which I believe no one has ever said, <laughs> ever. Second, she became, as, especially after his first presidential campaign in 1980, where she didn't play such a central role, later on she became a really important political advisor to President Bush. She was a real, she was an important sounding board, and she was someone who was willing to engage in tougher campaign tactics than he was. And it was only with her encouragement and approval that he was willing to air an ad that called the Senator Straddle ad, which was an ad they aired against Bob Dole in the New Hampshire primary in 1988. Uh, and this was an ad that did exactly what it was intended to do, which was unhinge Bob Dole. <laughs> and uh, that's when he then gave a TV interview where he said, stop lying about my record. It derailed Dole's presidential campaign after he had won in the Iowa caucuses. It was, it seems like a small thing. It was crucial. It was a crucial moment in the, the, b b uh, George Bush's ability to get on path to win the nomination and then the presidency. I asked almost every, I interviewed about 135 people for the book, and I asked almost everyone I interviewed whether George Bush would have become president without Barbara Bush. And George Bush said yes, <laughs> which I found hilarious because if it, my, someone asked my husband if he could have done anything without me, the correct answer is no. But <laughs> if he's listening, uh, he, George Bush said yes, he would have. Barbara Bush said absolutely he would have. Almost everybody else I interviewed said George Bush would not have been possible to pursue the career he did and become president of the United States without Barbara Bush by his side. A third consequential thing, she elevated the issue of literacy in a public way, and she dealt with the issue of AIDS in a more private one. And finally, fourth, she was the matriarch of a Bush dynasty. Now this was not something she liked to hear. She in fact did not like the title of my book. She didn't like the word matriarch, and she really hated the word dynasty because she, <laughs> and there aren't that many other words in the title, so that's a, uh, <clears throat> she thought they uh, kind of dripped with entitlement, uh, and that was not the way she, she was, um, but she was a mate, she was a matriarch, and it is a dynasty. She was the mother of a two-term Texas governor who became president. She was the mother of a man who became a two-term Florida governor. Um, and if you define dynasty in a way that looks beyond elective office, uh, she has a really impressive set of grandchildren as well. You know, I think that it can be hard. The generations that follow very powerful and successful people often struggle. But the record for the Bush family is pretty good. You think about Barbara Bush and the Global Health Corps, Lauren Bush Lauren, who helped found a global feeding program. Pierce Bush, who runs Big Brothers, Big Sisters of Greater Texas. Uh, Walker Bush, less well known, uh, joined the Marines and served in Afghanistan in service that was never publicly acknowledged during the years he was there. So I asked Barbara Bush what I should title my book, if not the title I wanted to title. And she said, The Fat Lady Sings Again. <laughs> Well, thank you for laughing at my jokes. And <laughs> and I would be delighted to hear your questions, or if you have comments, or if you have Bush stories, I'd be glad to hear them as well. That was wonderful. A uh, couple of things. First, we have some microphones that will be coming to you. We have some microphones uh, that will be coming to you so that everyone can hear and we can record your messages and your questions for posterity. Uh, I do want to give the first question to my good friend and colleague, Jim Falk, from World Affairs Council. They are a co-sponsor for the evening, so he gets the first bid. 
Thank you. And let me say the book is worth at least $32, if not a lot more. <laughs> Could you comment on how Barbara Bush handled issues such as abortion, where she had particular <laughs> views that were contrary to the Republican platform and what the president had to run on? You know, uh, I mentioned her diaries, and of course, diaries hadn't been processed, uh, have not been processed. The diaries are not uh, open for public release until 35 years after her death, so 34 more years before people can read her diaries. Um, so when I went through her diaries, they were in, in very rough, they hadn't been sort, they weren't like in chronological, they weren't always in chronological order. Some of the pages were stuck together. Uh, there were odd things just stuck in the diaries that she had, you know, you know how you do that when you've got a, a, a book, you find money in books sometimes, from people have stuck them there. Um, and when I opened up her diary from the 19, from 1980, which was one of the more formal diaries she kept, it was actually a leather bound uh, volume, um, I found in it a four page letter that Barbara Bush had written to herself. And this was a time when um, her husband was running for president for the first time. Abortion, she knew, was going to be an issue she would get asked about. And this letter was an effort to figure out for herself what she thought about the issue of abortion. And the top of the letter said, thoughts about abortion. And it runs through, it, it runs through in, in an in incredibly sincere way tries to sort out her feelings about that difficult issue. And in this issue, as with so many issues, she returned to her experience with Robin. And she says in this letter, I, I remember when Robin was born, and I felt her soul into her body. And I was there the instant that Robin died, and I felt her soul leave her body. And if your soul enters your body at the moment of your birth, abortion is not murder, and we should leave it up to women and their doctors. And you can disagree with the conclusion that she came to, but you cannot question the sincerity with which she was struggling with it. And that was, in fact, a position she maintained for the rest of her life, although there were a period of uh, 12 years where she refused to answer questions about it because it was politically inconvenient for her husband. But in this letter, there was not one word about what was going to be politically acceptable or politically convenient. It was entirely about the morality of the issue. And at the very end of this four-page letter, she had written something along the margin. She wrote, needs lots more thought. <laughs> yes? How long did it take you to actually read I think the diary? you're not obeying the instructions to wait for the <laughs> microphone. <laughs> Sorry. I don't want Jeff to get mad at me because he's buying dinner for one thing. Oh, okay. and, yeah. How long did it take you to actually read all of her diaries? Uh, well, uh, I don't know. I spent a lot of time there in College Station, um, and I would, I would, I, I, I should know the answer to that question. I don't. It, uh, you know, I would go there before. I'd be there the minute it opened and start reading through them, and I'd be there until they make me leave at the end of the day. Um, some of them I read with much more care than others uh, because there, there were some periods of her life that I was really interested in and I wanted to read every single word she wrote. And there were others where I knew that was not a time of her life I was going to spend much time with and I would scan much, more care, much less carefully. But there was not a page I didn't turn over uh, in her diaries because uh, if you get the privilege of reading them, I guess you probably ought to read them. Yes, sir, but wait for the microphone, or I think we know bad things will happen if you don't. Did you interview Laura Bush for your book, and could you comment on their relationship? I did interview. I interviewed Laura Bush on the phone uh, for this book, and I had actually interviewed her in the past. And when her book came out, I interviewed her. And we talked a little about her mother. Um, they had a, uh, I think they had a good relationship. They were mutually very respectful. Um, uh, Barbara Bush said she thought Laura Bush was the best first lady ever. In fact, there's a picture where George Bush is moderating something and the question from the floor was, who was the best first lady? And Barbara and Laura Bush pointed at each other. Um, and I don't know if they, well, I think that's a sign of, mutual respect. Um, I think that uh, it must have been hard to be 
Barbara Bush's daughter-in-law because she was such a forceful person. Uh, but I think that Laura Bush was a very forceful person in her own way, uh, in a quieter way. And I think um, did, was not, had her, kind of had her own uh, life as first lady that was independent in her own and not in the, so much in the shadow of her mother-in-law. I'm thinking about that was something that just happened in Washington a couple of days, a couple of weeks, two, week, two weeks ago, which is the National Book Festival on the Mall, which is a Laura Bush initiative and something she did, which was great. So I think it, I think it was good, but you know, mothers-in-law and daughters-in-law, who knows? Uh, you indicated pretty clearly uh, how Barbara felt about Don Trump. I wonder if she had any particular feelings or thoughts about Melania and her position as uh, First Lady. So uh, uh, Barbara Bush never met Melania Trump. Um, but right after the election, she sent Melania Trump a letter that said, congratulations, you're going to love living in the White House. It's a wonderful place to live. Um, she said, let me give you some an unasked for advice, which is a phrase I now use all the time. Let me give you some unasked for advice. Um, and she said, you know, it can be lonely in the White House for a, an only child. So you might think about letting Barron bring a friend with him to the White House. Um, and she also said, you know, at that point, there was a lot of speculation that Melania Trump might not move to the White House, might stay in New York. Uh, and, she, and Barbara Bush said, whatever you decide to do is fine. Uh, so it was a warm and friendly and helpful letter in that, you know, she was trying to offer advice from her experience. Actually, when I interviewed Hillary Clinton for this book, too, and this was exactly the, vi the advice Barbara Bush gave to Hillary Clinton when the Clintons were elected and Chelsea was going to be an only child in the White House, that she think about letting Chelsea bring a friend of the White House. There's something else she said to Hillary Clinton. Hillary, Hillary Clinton. Well, why, why are you laughing? You know. <laughs> she, when, she invited Hillary Clinton really soon after the election to come see the White House family quarters, which is always a point of some contention because the outgoing First Lady doesn't necessarily want to leave, and sometimes they delay. Nancy Reagan delayed quite a while before letting Barbara Bush come up and see the family quarters, which was kind of a burr in, uh, for Barbara Bush. But anyway, Barbara Bush invited Hillary Clinton early on, soon after the election, to the White House. And she greeted her by saying, um, I can't believe we lost. <laughs> were you as surprised as we were? <laughs> and Hillary Clinton said no. she make a diary entrance regarding not being being invited to the state dinner when <laughs> Prince and yeah. Charles, I mean. She, she did not. Um, she did make a diary entry about the interviews I did with her. So, you know, at the time she was, at that time she hadn't yet, I think, decided I could see her diaries. She was still in the, don't ask me about my diaries, you can never see them mode. And so she would make a diary entry after our interviews, which was uh, interesting. And in one of them she said, um, Susan Page was here again to talk to me about my biography, period. Boring, period. <laughs> and then she went on to some other topic. So in the first draft of the book I wrote, this was a reference, this was her typical self-deprecating humor. And my son Will read it and he said, how do you know she wasn't talking about you? <laughs> I said, you know, I guess you could read it that way. So in the book, I altered it. I said, this was either an example of her self-deprecating humor or she was talking about me. <laughs> At another point, she said, Susan Page was here to interview me for my biography. I like her, and I hope she is kind to me. But you know, to go back to the very first point I made about why I didn't talk to her before, ask her permission before signing a contract, was uh, she was she didn't try to put any restrictions on. She didn't try to control what I wrote. Uh, she was willing to just take a big leap of faith 
that it was going to be fair uh, and that it was worth doing, for which I'm obviously really grateful. Let, let me ask a question if I could, and we'll make this the final question so you can okay. go sign some books. It's not on? There it is. Uh, you know, I think of Barbara Bush as the archetype of a woman in her generation. Mm -hmm that you know, she is educated, she leaves her education to go with her husband. She supports him, as you pointed out, every step along the way. She values protecting her family as, as critical. Hillary Clinton was not that mm -hmm. in many ways. Did Barbara Bush ever reflect upon what she might have been had mm -hmm. she been born in a different age? Yeah. You know, um, uh, Jeb Bush did. Jeb Bush told me in an interview I did in 1990, so way back, I did an interview with Jeb Bush, in which, he, which fortunately I had saved, in which he said, you know, if my mother had been born in another generation, she would have been the president. Um, but this was not a subject on which Barbara Bush was willing to engage with me. And she, in fact, was, I think she felt uh, dissed by the women's movement that I think she felt it didn't acknowledge the value of the life she had chosen to live. And in one of the interviews, see, I think of Barbara Bush as a feminist because she's strong-minded and she's independent and she's fearless. Um, and so in one interview, so I, I think of her as walking the walk of feminism, but not talking the talk. So in one interview, I tried to get her to say she was a feminist. <laughs> <laughs> And we went, you know, I said, well, why don't you think you're a feminist? We went around and around, and then she'd do diversion. She'd like introduce some other, very Trump-like, introduce some other interesting topic, and we'd talk about them and said, but no, go back, why don't you think you're a feminist? And I finally gave up. I said, I'm gonna give up, you're being very slippery on this, and she said with a smile, yes, I am. <laughs> well, you've been a wonderful, wonderful audience. Thank you so much for coming. Once again, I'll remind you that there are books that you can purchase and have signed. Uh, we'll have Susan out there in order to uh, uh, sign those books. And I just want to remind you, please take a look at our website for future events. And I look forward to seeing you there. Thank you. <laughs>